like to start in verse 36. There we go. Now, before I read this, okay, Daniel only had four visions, believe it or not. Daniel's known for his prophecies, but he only had four visions. He did interpret two other visions of the pagan king. God gave the pagan king two visions, and Daniel interpreted those two visions. But he himself had four. Now, every vision in Daniel builds on the previous visions. Now, we've gone over that before, so I, I won't take you too much. But this last vision starts in Jan Daniel 10 and goes all the way through Daniel 12. It is one of the most complex visions and prophecies of any of the prophets of the Bible. It, what it does is it takes you right through the intertestamental period and there is 136 specific prophecies within this vision right here. And we've already gone through uh, much of it. And basically, every one of these visions, every one of these revelations and teachings of Daniel's always ends up basically in the same place. It's all, the, the subject is the, the fate of Israel in what's called the times of the Gentiles, that's what Jesus called it. Daniel calls it the indignation. As a judgment of God, the children of Israel are put into custody of Gentile nations until the end. Now guess what? It's still going on. It is still the indignation. The exile is not over. Israel has not been restored, although we are very close to the time, I believe. But all of these is the vision of Daniel 539 B.C., okay? And he sees all the way to the end. And basically, he says, you're going to be under the custody of four different Gentile empires. First the Babylonians, then the Persians, then the Greeks, and then the last one, which is the longest, the Romans. I think it's interesting, too, that two, the first two are Eastern and the last two are Western. And we're part of the Roman Empire. We're the, we're the heirs of the Roman Empire. Europe is the heir of the Roman Empire. He says, that'll be the last one, the last kingdom. And in fact, it's like the statue. He saw the whole thing laid out. But in the time of the last, the ten toes of the statue, the stone comes from heaven, not made by human hands, and smashes the vision, the, the statue in the feet and it doesn't break into pieces. It breaks into powder. And it just blows away. And the stone becomes a kingdom which fills the whole earth. That's Daniel's vision of the second coming of Jesus. And the geopolitical result. The end of the humanistic pagan enterprise. It's almost over. We're in his last gasps. But always. He... He ends up talking about a specific ruler that rises out of it. In Daniel 7, he calls him the little horn. And in Daniel 8, he calls him the king that does uh, his own thing. And Daniel chapter 9, he talks about he, his people are the ones that are going to destroy the temple. And then in Daniel 10, he just gets into real detail. And the other thing, now I'm, I'm trying not to belabor this because it's, it's overlapping, but I want you to see there's a flow in this book that everything flows out of everything else. And he always ends up talking about something called the abomination that makes desolate, the sacrilege, something that this ruler does while he has custody of the Jewish people that is so appalling, so abominable, that it renders the holy temple itself unusable until it has to be repurified. We just celebrated the Jewish holiday that commemorates that, Hanukkah. It's all the abomination that makes desolate. And we talked enough history to let you know that. That, was the, that, that leader's name was Antiochus Epiphanes. He came from the Greek Empire, and he drug a statue of Zeus into the holy place of the temple and made uh, a sacrifice of a pig on the holy altar and splattered the blood of the pig all over the temple. I mean, it's just awful. And that, uh, that's what started the war with the Maccabeans, and eventually that man claimed to be God himself. And then the Jews finally rose up and threw him off. 
Now that's ancient history, right? That is what happened in between the two testaments. And if you said abomination of desolation, every single Jew, just like if you say 911 now, every single person knows that phrase that's referring to a historical event. Something happened, they'll immediately identify it. Abomination and desolation is the same thing. Every single Jew talked, taught their children, you got this holiday, oh, these are terrible times, this terrible person came, this terrible person did terrible things, and he made a sacrifice to idols, and he splattered the temple and desecrated it, and, and, and that was it. And then what happened is when, when Antiochus did that, the Jews that understood fled immediately out into the wilderness because they were going to have a counterattack and a counteroffensive, and you had the Jewish war with Antiochus, and eventually they prevailed, right? Along comes Jesus 200 years later. And he's telling the definitive chapter in the Bible about, about the end times. His disciples literally gathered around him and said, Jesus, look at this temple. You see how beautiful it is? I'm qu quoting Matthew 24. You see these stones of the temple? And it would be impressive, right? It was beautiful. It was awesome. And then Jesus said, you see those stones? There won't be one of them left on another. And then they, they gathered around him and they said, what shall be, what, when will these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So they're asking about the end of the age. And one of the things Jesus said, and I've repeated this and repeated, but it's, he quoted Daniel. He said, when you see the abomination that makes desolate, standing in the holy place, the reader of Daniel shall understand. And then he said, you flee to Judea. If you're in Judea, flee to the wilderness. And don't even go back and get your coat. Get out of there. Run for your life. And then he quoted Daniel 12. We'll see the verse tonight. For then there will be tribulation such as the world has never seen before, nor is it, will it ever see again. <laughs> Try to imagine someone giving a speech here. Hey, when you see 911 happen, you're going to go, what do you mean? It already happened. He's going to throw you for a loop at first until you realize what he's saying. When you see 911 happen, when you see the abomination that makes desolate happen, and then he repeats history. Remember, they fled in the wilderness. Every Jew knew that. Every single Jew knew what happened, the story of the Maccabees, the story of their history. It wasn't even that long ago, 200 years. Flee to the wilderness. What's he saying? It's going to happen again. That's why he spends so much time. Do you know Daniel talks more about the Antichrist than the book of Revelation does? What's he saying? He's, he's saying, look, it's going to happen again. And Revelation 11, as we talked two weeks ago, it goes through the career of this Antiochus Epiphanes, how he came to power, what he did, how he desecrated the temple, how he set up the abomination, how he died. But then you get to Daniel chapter um, 11. Uh, We'll start in verse 36. See, he starts talking about someone. And the more he talks about it, the, you realize he, he's not talking about Antiochus anymore. This isn't ancient history. This is the future. Between 35 and 36, he leaps ahead 2,000 years. He says, the king will do according to his will. He will exalt himself and magnify himself. Above every God. And he will speak marvelous things against the God of gods. And he will prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that which is determined shall be done. The indignation is the period of, pro of punishment of the Jews. It's not over yet. Someone's going to rise up right at the end. Right before it's accomplished. Right before the end comes. And basically he's going to be just like Antiochus. Paul quoted this in Thessalonians when he said that the end can't come until the wicked ones revealed. Who, and here's Paul's words, who opposes and exalts himself above God and above all that is called God or that is worshipped as God, showing himself that he is God and shall show, present himself as God. 
He's quoting Daniel chapter 9, verse 36, 37. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor shall he regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. He will put self above everything, everything. You know, normal people, you know, whoever your father's God was, I mean, then you follow that, basically. That was the pattern, anyway, for a long time, unless you get converted. This guy will have no sentiment whatsoever, no religious inclination. He will not consider any religion whatsoever. He shall not regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor shall he regard any... Oh, he won't regard the desire of women. Now... You can't. You don't, don't want to be presumptuous. I mean, he might be a homosexual, but it doesn't say that. Hitler wasn't interested in women. He wasn't a homosexual. He wasn't all that interested in women. He got married the last day of his life, and then he killed himself. Okay. He, he was single and, and did not consider that because he was so focused on what he was and his mission in life and, of course, himself. And he's a type of the Antichrist. Nor will he regard any God. Instead, he magnifies himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So on the one hand, he says he won't, won't regard any God, he won't regard any religion, certainly not the God of his fathers. Whatever he was, he's not going to be that. And, and on the other hand, he's going to introduce a new religion, a God of forces, a God never known before. And he's going to honor that God. Of course, so will a lot of other people. See, basically what Daniel's going to do here is he's going to tell you all, take you all the way to the time in the end. He's going to tell you what's going to happen. What's going to happen? There's going to be a world leader. What's going to happen? There's going to be a world religion, a new religion, a God of forces. Okay. And we're ripe for a new religion. The world's ripe for a new religion because it's a post-Christian world and it's a world that's lost faith in all of the traditional religion. And yet they... Worship self. What does the Bible say about the last days? In the last days, perilous times will come because men will be lovers of self. And they worship other things. Patron of the nation. And it's a prince is a fallen angel. A prince is not a human being. A pr the prince in the Bible is a fallen angel. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and rulers of the darkness of this age. They, they had a prince. The, the, the Persian Empire had a prince, the prince of Persia, and the Greek Empire had a prince, the prince of Grecia. And these are fallen, evil uh, angels that resisted God and resisted Gabriel, the, the angel. And they're, coming, and they're going to come again. But here is another part of this revelation that he gives us. He basically picks up the curtain and shows us a little glimmer of insight into a realm that we can't know anything about other than what he shows us. And that is, there is one nation that has a legitimate prince, Michael the Archangel. And that nation is Israel. Now, just Sunday, we were doing Revelation 12, where he says, I saw a war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought the dragon and his angels and cast them out of heaven. So Michael is always associated with war. And here he says he's the great prince which stands for the children of thy people. Now, the, thy people is Israel. Now, someone might ask, well, where, where is Michael? Where was he in the Holocaust? Where? Where has he been all these long, dark centuries of exile? But well, we have to remember that Israel, for the time being, is under a punishment, the indignation, the exile. But what happens at the end? It comes to a point where it's over. The exile's over. But it's, it's accompanied in a time, he says, there will be a time of trouble or tribulation. That's where we get the expression, the tribulation. A lot, of, a lot of people know just enough about the Bible. The great tribulation. 
There's coming a time. It's not seven years, it's three and a half years. But it'll be the worst time on earth. And he, he literally put it this way, and so did Jesus. There will be great tribulation such as the world has never seen before. Now that's saying a lot. Because there's been some pretty bad times in this world. And as, as for Israel, which Daniel focuses on, there will be a time of trouble like this nation's never seen before. Really? You don't even have to think back very far to see horrific, hellish troubles coming upon Israel. You're telling me that's not even the full of it? The Holocaust isn't, isn't the full of, fullest of it? And by the way, the Holocaust is just the, the latest of it. For the last 2,000 years, Israel has been under tremendous persecution, exile, alienation, suffering, disrooted, disenfranchised all over the world. You know what it is? It's a miracle there is in Israel. It is a miracle. And I owe that, that, we owe that to the, the, to the Lord himself. He said, it would be a terrible time. Jeremiah the prophet called it, the time of Jacob's trouble. The time of Jacob's trouble. And in Jeremiah 30, he has a prophecy that says, you know, you ever see a man in labor? Like a woman? You ever see a woman give a birth? Well, yeah, how about a man gra grabbing his loins in agony and labor? He said, what am I seeing here? And then the answer came from God. You're seeing the time of Jacob's trouble. It's night. It's when God cuts off all of Israel's friends and lovers, like the United States, and God deals with her specifically. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble, and that's designed to make you think of the time when Jacob, in his own life story, thought that his life was over because his brother was going after him and was going to confront him. His brother that thought that he cheated him was going to confront him, and Jacob gets stripped down to nothing. He sends his wives away. He sends his children away. He sends his flocks away. He sends everybody away. And at the end, he is by himself. And in the dark black night, when he thinks it's all over, suddenly there's someone there that's wrestling him. <laughs> he gets into a wrestling match, of all things. One person. And then he's wrestling with this guy. And then he, the guy touches him in the hip and dislocates his hip. Now, Daniel Gable, who's a wrestling coach, just got the National Medal of Freedom, right? Because he's, he's the greatest wrestler, all right? And he just told me, uh, he told us one time that the hips are the most important, strongest muscle in your body, and control of the hips is the main source for winning wrestling matches. So the angel just touches him on the hip, and he's just dislocated. But Jacob doesn't stop. He does stop wrestling because he can't wrestle. Now listen to this. He just clings. It turns out the... the it was God. He thought he was wrestling with his brother, but really he was wrestling with God all along. <laughs> all of his troubles, all of his trials, all of his disappointments and letdowns, and then in the end, he's stripped away. Night comes, he gets stripped away of everything he used to rely on, wealth, family, whatever. He's just, it's just down to him and God. And he's wrestling God. And he's so strong. You know, usually people think strong, that's my best part of me. No, that might be your worst. Where you're so strong. So God just touches him at his strongest point and just totally weakens him. The man walked with a limp for the rest of his life. But he wouldn't let go of God. He clung to him. He's not wrestling anymore, he's just clinging. And God himself is even saying to him, let me go. <laughs> he says, I won't let you go unless you bless me. You know what? He realizes, I never had anything. What I really need is God. Not wealth, not connections, not military power, not strength. 
what I really need. And it took this to show him, just like God's doing that to the people right here in this room and right out there in Cyberland. You just get stripped down to nothing and you realize that all you ever needed is God and that your real wrestling match has been with God himself. And when the day began to dawn, he said, I won't let you go unless you bless me. And God said, what's your name? And he said, Jacob. And God said, from now on out, your name is Israel. And do you know what Israel means? The man who wrestled with God prevailed. Did he prevail? Did he pin God? <laughs> no, with God, you win by losing. <laughs> you surrender to God. You give your life. Now look. What happened to Jacob, and this is found in the book of Genesis, is what's going to happen to Jacob's nation, which is called Israel. But really, that's the ideal name. There's still Jacob at this point. And what is going to happen in this world? This is the meaning of what's happening all over the world. It's God dealing with his sacred people, trying to bring them to repentance. And God, how we know God plays rough? I mean, if that's what it takes. And those people are stubborn. And the, God, the whole reason for the tribulation is, is God's going to strip everything away from Israel. Everything. Everything they relied on. Everything they trusted in. Everything they looked to. Everything they prided themselves on. Oh, man, the IDF, the, the six-day war and all that stuff. He's going to strip all that away. And who's Israel's biggest friend ge geopolitically in the world today? America. God's going to take that away, too. I don't know when. I don't know if it'll be Trump or Biden. But believe me, the Lord's going to strip that away until there's nothing but them and God. Oh, and by the way, Jacob's twin, Esau. The counterpart part to that is the Arab Muslim world. Let me tell you what the Muslims believe. Muslims believe in the last day, too. They're all messed up, but they do believe in the last days. Only they have a place in their hadiths that says it two or three times. The last days can't come until we Muslims kill all the Jews. In that day, it's called the prophecy of the tree. In that day of slaughter, a Jew will be hiding behind a tree or a rock. And the tree or the rock will cry out. Hey, Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Can you believe the world wants these people to make peace with Israel and Israel with them? How could you? When it's all stripped away, it's the time for Jacob's trouble. It's the time for the great wrestling match. It's at night, but we're waiting for the day, breaking of the day. Now, I've kind of got off my text, but I think this is important. Look. We are entering into night for the world. Bad, bad times for this world are coming. Now, we don't have to be paralyzed by fear. We're Christians. By the way, we're going to leave sometime. The rapture is going to happen someday. Amen? But night's fallen. And all the enmity is still there. Anyway, let me go on. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. It's the tribulation. It's night. Or another word for it is, it's the siege. Now, there's a really powerful prophecy, and I will just quote it, but I'll just quote it. Zechariah chapter 12 says, The burden of the Lord for Israel. Well, let me look it up, because I don't want to uh, mis misquote it. I actually wrote a book about it. The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretches forth the heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the nations round about. He says, when they shall be in the siege, both against Judah and Jerusalem. In that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the peoples of the earth gather against it. Time for Jacob's trouble. He goes on to say in Revelation or Zechariah 14, 
I'll gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. The city will be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished. Half the city will go into captivity. The rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then will the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle. And his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. You see, it's not just Daniel. All the prophets predict this. This is what the end's going to be like. You got a world leader. You got a world religion. You got a new God of forces that's going to be worshipped very widely. You got a world war. You know how in the book of Revelations it says, Who is like the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And that's in Revelation 13. That's what the world is saying. You know that's a worship song? We got a song that we sing here from Exodus 15. Who is like unto you, O Lord? They're going to sing, Who is like the beast? They're going to worship him. That's what the mark of the beast is going to be, worship. You want, you, the way to worship the beast would be to subscribe to his system. And believe me, people will line up to do it. But if you do it, if you do it, you just cross the point of no return. There is no redemption for that. I don't know how I could handle that, seeing people that I love, if they get the mark. I don't, I don't know how to react to that. It goes on. Uh, you're going to have a world tribulation, but there's going to be deliverance. Verse 1, there was, uh, at that time, Michael will stand up, the great prince, which stands for the children of thy people. And there will be a time of trouble such as never was since, never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, everyone that should be found written in the book. Now, he's saying there that at that time, Israel will be saved. I'm going to tell you what the end is going to be like. Israel, which doesn't, for the most part, believe in God, persecutes their own people that are Christians. Israel, that is every religion but the real religion, is going to be saved one day. In one day. One day they'll be saved. Now, the Apostle Paul, who was an Israelite and who loved the Jews, said this. When they were put away from God... Because of their unbelief. They fell. They backslid. And they were put away. He said. That was mercy. For us Gentiles. <laughs> we, it's like. Oh the older brother doesn't want his inheritance. Here I'll give it to you. That's not even in the family. Oh really? But he said. When they're brought back. Into fellowship with God. Like the prodigal son. You know they get the coat and the robe and the shoes. That will be the resurrection of the dead for this world. It'll be a brand new day. The millennium will commence. A great day of righteousness will dawn. So Israel shall be saved. But he says not all of them. Only the ones found written in the book. That's an, I was going to talk about that, but I took too much time on the other stuff. But listen, God has a book and he puts your name in it. Now look. God is hopeful. He doesn't want anyone to perish. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. He doesn't want anyone to be lost. So he puts your name in the book. Your name was written in a book before you were even born. It's the book of God. And he gives you every single opportunity possible to get right with God and come back to God. And even if you fall a thousand times, you get back up and go back to God, right? And your name is in that book. But if you die in your sins... Your name will be blotted out of that book. And that's the worst thing possible. Like, he's going to go on to say there's going to be a resurrection, see? And one of the things that happens at the resurrection is the books are open. Now, on that day, <laughs> you're going to hope to God that your name is in that book. Let's see, Bill Randall's. <laughs> Probably more than one of me. But you're going to be holding your breath. <laughs> Good Lord, please let my name be in that book. All right? Because everything is hinged on that. You know? Those found in the book. The book of Psalms says, You tell my wanderings. You even put my tears in a bottle. You know, God cares about all your tears and cares. And then he says, 
Aren't they in your book? Yes, they are. And Jesus said in Luke, when they came back and they said, you know, we cast out evil spirits and the spirits had to obey us. He said, don't rejoice in that, that the spirits have to obey you. Rejoice that your names are written in the book of life. Now, world leader, world religion, a new religion, the God of forces, a world war, a world tribulation, troubles. But deliverance for Israel, for those found in the book, the whole nation will be saved in one day. And then resurrection, verse 2. Many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now what it literally says is many among the sleepers shall awake. So to God, you don't really die, you sleep. You just fall asleep. What does it mean that you don't really die? Well, you do die. I'm not going to you know, tell you that there's no such thing as death. The wages of sin is death. But what it's saying is that to God, you're asleep. And when it's time for him to rouse you from sleep for judgment, boom, up you come to give account. Like there's this tract I like called This Was Your Life. How many have ever seen it? It's like a comic book, but it tells the gospel, right? And this guy is gone in, in the grave and everyone's standing around him on the ground and they're going, he was a good man. But then it says, was he? And then all of a sudden he hears his voice in the grave. Boom, he's up. And the angel's taking him up to judgment. And he's saying, hey, I don't believe in this stuff. But it's hollow because he's gone. He's going there. That came from this scripture and from Jesus again quoting it in John chapter 5. The dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God. And they'll come forth out of their graves. And then he goes on to say, they that have done what it literally says is the good. They that have done the good unto everlasting life, the resurrection of life. They that have done the evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Now, I'd like to take a minute to explain this. The good is what Jesus said, and the evil. You know how many good things there are that you can do? Only one. Only one. And you know how many evil things there are that you could do? You'd think there'd be a lot, but really there's only one. There's the good and the evil. What? I could tell you 10, 15 evil things a person could do. I could tell you 100. Nope, they all spring from the evil or the good. What is the good out of which all good flows? Well, for us sinners, there's only one good thing you can do. And that is admit that you're a sinner and accept Jesus Christ into your heart as Lord. That's the only good thing you can do. And if you do that, then all of that springs all other good. And there's only one evil. It is the evil of evils. And that is to reject God's offer of salvation and to insist on going your own way and to shut the door of your heart to the light of God. That is the only evil thing you can do. But those who do it, it opens the door to a whole world of evil. And so Daniel saw the same thing Jesus saw. But I'm going to tell you something about what Daniel's saying in verse 2, if you don't mind. Is that many of them this, uh, among the sleepers... <laughs> In the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. The thing is, is that he sees it all as one event, but really there's a thousand my, uh, years between these two events. Okay. The resurrection of the just shall happen at the second coming of Jesus. And they shall be uh, entered into the joy. Like he says, come you blessed of the Father, enter into the joy when the Son of Man comes with the angels of his glory and majesty. Come, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Come into the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the earth. 
That's what Daniel said there. The sum to everlasting life. And I'm going to tell you something, man. I've got so far off what I intended to say tonight, but it's still so true and real that there is a joy and a beauty and a glory that will make you forget all of your troubles on this earth, every one of them. Just around the corner. Just almost ready to break out. That if this is your only, uh, if, if you're saved, then anything bad that happens to you in life, that's as bad as it'll ever get. Okay, that's for the saved, right? There's a beauty. But a thousand years later, the dead that were died in their sins, they'll be brought up. Books will be open. Everything that they ever thought, did, said, whatever. And then they will, uh, they will be entering into, this is a terrible description, by the way. Shame forever, everlasting contempt forever. I don't even like to be treated with contempt by a human being, and I have been before. And it's always a miserable experience to be treated with disrespect and contempt. How would you like to be treated with contempt by God forever? <laughs> Daniel saw it all. This is the best description in the Old Testament of what, how it's all going to end. Resurrection and judgment, everlasting shame or everlasting righteousness. And he says, and they that are wise, wise, what's wise in the Bible? You <laughs> get a clue. Look what's going on here and go the right way. That's wise. Those that are wise, he says, why, they'll shine like the brightness of the firmament. And if you turn many to righteousness, you'll shine like the stars forever. In other words, there's one world leader, there's a new world religion, and a new God coming. That, by the way, will make a lot of sense to all the disparate elements of this unbelieving world. And they will just instantly resonate. There's a world war. There's a worldwide tribulation. There's deliverance for Israel at the end of it, of course, and the resurrection of the dead from the world. And there is a resurrection and judgment. And verse 3 tells us there's a reward, <laughs> which I live for. I would like to shine forever. I can't shine in this dark world, but I'd like to shine forever in that one. This world wouldn't give you the credit for anything if you're Christian. I mean, if you're degenerate <laughs> they, they love you but we could shine forever in the world to come and look you can look at a person on the outside and not see a thing about them you don't know their pains their aches their sorrows their trials what they came through what they overcame but God sees it all and one of the things that's going to happen at the resurrection is that whatever you really are in God, which we'll just burst forth. Jesus said, in the regeneration, the righteous shall shine like the sun. Let me just try and finish this chapter here. I'm getting too excited. See, I can't stop. He said, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book. Even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Well, certainly it's true. Many run to and fro and knowledge increased. And many people point to this as a fulfillment of Scripture. We know more now than we ever did, and people travel far and wide more than they ever did. But I hate to disappoint you, that's not the interpretation of this. Sounds great, because it's true. <laughs> right? No. He said, the knowledge. What he's saying is, the closer you get to the end... When it says they run to and fro, what that means is they'll pour over these prophecies. Now, amazing. Isaac Newton himself said, at the time of the end, men will study the prophecies and they will know more than we know right now. Because they knew. And what God's saying is, Daniel, your book is going to be 
for the end. And the people at the end will understand it on a level. People in your day and down through the centuries don't. At the end, many, many will pour over these scriptures because they'll see how fulfilling they already are in their own life. And they will, the knowledge of the, of the prophecies will increase. Then I, Daniel, looked, and behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which is on the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? How long? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was cast upon the waters of the river, Oh, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and he swore by him that lives forever, that it shall be for a time and times and half, and when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things will be finished. How long are we going to go through all this stuff? With the beast, the antichrist, the persecution, the desecration, the desolation. How long? And the angel goes like this, and it's, he was on one side of the river, but here it says he's on the river, so he's standing on the water. He says, he swore by God, and he said, it'll be three and a half years, a time and times and half a time, three and a half years. And what God will do, he says, he'll accomplish what he sets out to do. What is that? To shatter the power of the holy people. Shatter the power of the holy people. You know, Israel is one of the strongest nations on earth, even though it's tiny. And they got weapons we never even conceive of. We sell them our best weapons, and then they improve them. They're powerful. Someone says, that's good. No, that's bad. Because to the extent that they're powerful, they won't turn to God. What God's going to do is shatter their power until they're looking up. Until they say, I, we need you, God. We haven't outgrown you. We need you. Their back's going to be against the wall. I wish I could go into more detail on that, but I won't because of time. I heard, verse 8, but I understood not. Then I said, oh, my Lord, what's going to be the end of these things? And he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed to the time of the end. Daniel wanted to know more. The angel said, no, you can't know more. This thing is sealed to the end. Well, guess what? That's one of the signs of the end times. This book is being unsealed. People are beginning to understand it. And I'm telling you, I've seen it widespread. All you got to do is go online. I mean, so many people talking about Daniel, and they're really get, bringing out things about Daniel. He says, and I, th th this is all very important, so that's why. I, many shall be purified and made white and tried. But the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. Now, I think this is really important, too, by the way. We are going to go through rough times. Someone says, man, I'm glad 2020 is done. Look, 2021 is going to be more the same. In fact, in fact maybe more intense. It doesn't have to destroy us. What you got to do is understand what God's doing there. He said, many will be purified. And the word that they use for purify in the Bible means you put the gold in a furnace and out comes all the scum and the heat makes it all go to the top so it can be skimmed off and you can be purified if you'll allow it. Right? But what happens if you resist it? You don't become better, you become worse. That's what he's saying there. Well, the wicked are going to do wickedly. In other words, the wicked are even going to be more wicked. Okay. You got a guy in California that films a conversation with Planned Parenthood people saying, we're going to sell baby parts and make a big profit. We keep the baby alive so we can keep the brain ready for just take it right out of the head and just sell it down the road. And he films all that. And who do the judges condemn? Him. He just got a $13 million fine. <laughs> the wicked are going to get worse. Believe me. They get bolder and bolder as they come to the end. Plus, they're resisting more knowledge. And the more knowledge you resist, the worse you become. If you succumb to the knowledge, it, be, it purifies you. The wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked will understand. That's the other thing. The, the lowest Christian in the least, most despised church in the land knows more about what's really going on in this world. 
because they get understanding. The wicked don't get understanding. Guess what? I found this to be so true. The wicked don't get it. And they can't get it. And they won't get it unless they turn to God. They just don't get it. From the time that the daily sacrifice will be taken away and the abomination that makes desolate set up. See, it's going to happen again. The desolation is going to happen again. There will be 1,290 days. It's three and a half years in one month. Blessed is he that waits and comes to the 1,335 uh, days. Now, this is confusing to a lot of people, and to me too, admittedly, but I will throw out what I think this is saying. The tribulation will last three and a half years, and Jesus will come back. But the coming of Jesus isn't going to happen all in one day. The coming of Jesus is a procession from Mount Sinai all the way up to Jerusalem. He says, wait, blessed is the one that goes the full length. Remember, he's talking to the Jews. But go your way till the end, for you will rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. Father, in the name of Jesus, take uh, these faltering words and thoughts and let them make sense and let them convict and purify all of us and let them lead us to God and to life everlasting and snatch some out of the fire that are watching by uh, video or by CD or well, whatever you call this streaming streaming snatch them right out of the fire and let them come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ our salvation the Lord who loved us and washed us from our sins with his own blood in Jesus name Amen. Thank you, everybody, for your attention. God bless you.